Hi, I'm Jerry Sparks, president of AG Financial Insurance Solutions, and I'm a certified insurance counselor and certified risk manager. And today we have with us again, Rich Hammer, a well-known attorney, best-selling author in regards to church law, and probably one of the most knowledgeable uh, attorneys and people I know in regards to risk management and how to handle things for churches. So glad to have you here. Rich, today we have on Risk Management Live one of the the best topics I think that we've had because actually I've got people asking us questions before we even started today and our topic today is guns and churches and why has this become such a hot issue for churches today? Well Jerry I think it's almost entirely due to one fact and that is the passage of concealed weapons permit laws in every state now but Illinois over the last 20 years or so and these laws permit citizens uh, to carry concealed weapons uh, so long as they have a permit issued by the state that requires them to attend uh, a concealed weapons permit training course, which usually is anywhere from four to eight hours, and have minimal exposure to a firing range of uh, uh, 30 or 60 minutes of uh, the use of a, of a weapon under those circumstances. Now, these concealed weapons permit laws exempt certain properties, and of course, they vary from state to state, uh, but in virtually every state, uh, churches are exempt, uh, as are government buildings, schools, uh, libraries, airports, etc. So the point is, in most states, even people that have a concealed weapons permit issued by the state cannot bring their weapon onto church premises unless, in many states, they have written permission from church leadership. And so the question is, why would church leaders want to give permission to somebody with one of these permits to bring their weapons onto church property. And I think, Jerry, there are two reasons for this that, that I encounter. Number one is the perception that we need to allow people to bring their weapons to church to protect our congregation from crazed assail assailants who are going to bring weapons onto our property. We need to take them out and let's let these people uh, bring their weapons. My church, on any given Sunday, I don't know, scores if not a hundred or more people have uh, concealed weapons. So we've tried to have some control over this process by having individuals with a permit apply for permission where the church gives express permission to them uh, to carry their weapon. Now keep in mind, the fact that they have the concealed weapons permit, that requires a full-fledged criminal background check. Uh, plus, as I say, the minimal training. So the, the first reason I think church leaders sometimes are eager to let these people bring their weapons onto church premises is to, to protect the congregation. And the second reason is to protect the church itself from liability. You know, if, a, if an armed assailant comes into a church and starts shooting and five or ten people are injured or killed, the concern is, can our church be liable for this? because we didn't have a, uh, some type of a security guard present, and maybe these concealed weapons permit holders fit the bill. What's interesting is that you said 100 people may have armed weapons uh, at your church, but I'm sure your church has not given permission to hundreds of people having uh, their gun on premises. So uh, that's right. We, we, t we have taken control of the process in my church by requiring people to go through a, a application process that have the permit and then we can vet them and if anybody on our governing board knows of any reason why a particular individual perhaps we would not want them to have a, uh, uh, that, uh, that ability, you know, we're, we're able to kind of veto that person. But So at this point we've had maybe uh, 20 people uh, okay. obtain that uh, permission. Let's talk about how and why a church could be held liable um, for this. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that second issue. And, and maybe we could back up and talk about the first, the first reason that we see churches allowing people to c carry concealed weapons on the church premises, and that being the protection of members. That may or may not be a correct assumption based on the ability of those permit holders. <laughs> I mean, in my own case, yes, I'm being a little transparent with you today. I, I have a concealed <laughs> weapons, just about everybody in my state does. I have a concealed weapons permit. Uh, now, does that mean, and, and by the way, my church has approved me as carrying my weapon to church, which I don't do, uh, usually, <laughs> and uh, I don't want to be too transparent here, but uh, so the point is, am I the kind of guy you want protecting the congregation if an armed assailant stands up in the middle of a church service and starts killing people? I mean, there is no way. If I'm standing 50 feet away, 
I'm going to be able to, sh to hit that person. I mean, I may, I may try, but the likelihood is I'm going to hit somebody else. There's going to be a collateral damage. And so uh, I think there's a lot of these permit holders in that category, Jerry, that I don't know that they are effectively going to be able to respond to an armed assailant. Now, on the other hand, there are some that are highly skilled that have, are very adept at using firearms, many of them with military or law enforcement experience. And these are the kind of people that, yeah, maybe we should. So I think it's a good idea for churches, not just to whole cloth accept everybody uh, you know, that, that's a permit holder, but maybe to take another step and say permit plus, uh, permit plus prior military, law enforcement background, or some uh, additional training such as has happened at your church. Yeah, what we've done, actually, we first started off at our church. What we have done is we've used uh, off-duty police officers and or sheriff's uh, office because they go through the proper training already, okay? So we allowed them to actually act as our security officers. The other thing is once a licensed law officer pulls a gun, they're not operating on behalf of the church or themselves as an individual. They're operating as a police officer or as a law enforcement officer. So that is, you know, as far as having a church policy, that would be the best policy. If, if all of your people that had guns were actually licensed law, current law, law uh, enforcement officers, that'd be number one. A second thing that we could look at um, because of the concealed carry and um, everybody uh, asking to carry their guns in churches, uh, which has happened uh, quite a bit with ushers and security people, is having the proper training for the people that uh, have concealed carry. And I'm not talking uh, the training that comes with concealed carry and you had to hit, hit the broadside of a barn at five feet. Um, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody that hasn't passed that, okay? But what I'm talking about is what we use is the people that are training. I hit the target once out of ten. Well, then you didn't get your you didn't get your concealed carry, did you? I did. Yeah, <laughs> one out of ten. That's not good. Uh, <laughs> what what we're talking about is with the law enforcement. If the person that is training the law your 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 uh, local law enforcement people, if they can train your people in your church and they go through the same training that local law enforcement is then actually I would feel comfortable with those people carrying guns um, and, and having guns in the church and be recognized by the church. Once again, you said most, well, I think all states do not allow the carrying of guns in the church. So actually, if you have a person that is carrying a gun in the church and it is not recognized by the church under their policy to, be, uh, to have that ability to do that, they actually are in violation of their, their uh, concealed carry permit and can lose their permit and actually face prosecution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there is damage from that, the church probably is not going to be held liable because they had no, no uh, idea that this was happening. However, if somebody that has a permit and you have had the training, okay, so you, you set that up and they do do some collateral damage, the church could have some liability. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the church liability um, and what has happened in the past with some of the cases that mm -hmm. you've seen and how the church could be held responsible. Okay, Let, let's talk about that issue of, uh, that, that, that causes some churches to allow permit holders to bring their concealed weapons onto church premises is to, to reduce or to manage the church's potential liability for death or injury to people because of, a, of an armed assailant. And there are really, uh, there are four ways that the church could face liability in these cases. Number one is what is called the principle of premises liability, and we'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. The second one is uh, a failure on a church's part to hire or provide security guards. And number three is negligent selection of security guards by the church. And number four is liability for the negligent acts of those security personnel. So let's talk briefly about each one of these. Uh, the first one is premises liability. And, and the basic principle here legally is this, that any property owner has a duty to protect persons who come onto his or her property from harm. Uh, and, and, but generally, that duty does not extend to criminal acts. You have no duty to protect entrance onto your property from criminal activity unless it is foreseeable. 
Now, what, what does that mean? Well, the, the courts have really looked at a variety of factors in determining if prior criminal activity makes a, a crime foreseeable on your premises. And let me mention three or four of those factors the courts look to. Number one, were there previous crimes on your premises or close by? Number two, how similar were those crimes to the crime that occurred on your property? And number three, uh, how recently did those other crimes occur? And number four, uh, were those prior crimes publicized? I mean, if they happened four blocks away and it never was in the media, uh, you didn't even know about it, there has to be some importation of knowledge to church leadership that these other crimes did occur, which is not a problem if they happen on your premises. But obviously, the farther away those crimes are from your property, and the more dissimilar they are to the, uh, to the uh, assault that happened on your property, the more unlikely it is that they're foreseeable, that that assault on your property is foreseeable. And as a result, you have no liability legally for the assault that occurred. And that's the bottom line. The fact is, the vast majority of churches in this country are safe places that have never had an armed assailant injure or kill people uh, or a similar act within a short distance from your church in recent memory. So the fact is, under this legal doctrine of premises liability, most churches simply do not have a legal duty to provide armed security guards. Uh, again, that will depend on other similar violent criminal acts occurring on or near your property in recent months or maybe in the last few years. Did that, did that occur? And was that knowledge imparted to you? Uh, only under those circumstances do you meet that foreseeability test. There have been many cases where this has happened. Only a few have involved churches, but in every one, a court concluded that the, the, uh, there was no foreseeability because there were no similar crimes in recent history on or near church premises, so there was no duty to provide armed security guards. So here is a case in South Carolina where a church was not liable for injuries sustained by a person who was attacked on church property. Yes, there was property crimes in that area, burglaries, etc., but there was no violent assaults uh, or attacks anywhere near that church in recent history, and so this particular crime was simply not foreseeable, and the church was held to be not liable. Uh, probably the most uh, popular, the most publicized case in this context involved a McDonald's restaurant in 1984, where an individual, uh, an armed individual, came into a uh, McDonald's restaurant in Southern California and started shooting people. This individual had an, a number of automatic weapons and killed 19 and seriously injured another 11, as I recall. Many of these were children. And uh, some of those victims and victims' families sued McDonald's Corporation and said, you were negligent, and as a result, you're liable for all this carnage because you did not provide an armed security guard on your premises at all times. And the, the lawsuit, the plaintiffs uh, pointed out that this McDonald's was in fact in a high crime area. There were all kinds of crimes in the neighborhood where this McDonald's occurred, but nevertheless, a California appeals court ruled that McDonald's was not liable because it was simply not foreseeable despite the crimes that occurred in the neighborhood. None of those made it foreseeable that this guy would come into their restaurant and kill 19 people and injure 11 more. And I think uh, there's one excerpt from the court's decision that I think is very telling and very relevant. The court said, what protective measures should be pursued to protect against a mass murderous assault defy precise delineation? Because how can one know what measures will be effective against a degenerate psychopath or psychotic the type of unforeseeable criminal conduct involved here would require extensive protective measures of questionable deterrent value when confronted by an assailant bent on committing mass murder. In other words, the kind of harm involved here cannot be deterred by such measures. And I think, Jerry, that's an important point, that uh, it, it is literally, as this court and many others have said, it's impossible to deter uh, a dedicated um, assailant who is bent on causing uh, death and carnage within a church or any other facility from getting into that property 
and uh, engaging in those acts. So we're talking in most of these cases about response. What is the church or the entity's response to that individual? And so I think let me just conclude by saying that with regard to the first basis for liability, churches generally have no legal duty to provide armed security unless there is a foreseeability that somebody's going to enter onto church premises and start trying to kill people. And now that, that's not to say that can't happen. I'm sure it has. It would be true for some churches in this country, but it would be a relatively, I think, a small number or percentage of churches. So that's the, uh, but, but that's not to say a church should not have a security presence because apart from the legal duty, which as I say, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, is probably not required Many churches view this as a theological or ethical duty that we view as Christians, human beings, as made in the image of God, of infinite worth and value, and do they not deserve protection even if the risk is, in fact, unforeseeable or very low? Uh, the value of their life is so high, especially children, that maybe we should implement uh, protective measures. And I think that would explain in my own church why we do this. Not because we feel we have a legal duty, because I don't believe that we do, but we believe there's a theological uh, imperative involved here based on our understanding of Scripture and of God's nature. Now, another basis for liability, apart from the premises liability that requires foreseeability, is uh, a failure to hire security guards in the first place. And the two are kind of related. But generally, there's no duty to hire security guards if there's not a foreseeable, uh, if, if it's not foreseeable that you're going to have a violent criminal attacks on your premises. And there have been a number of cases where, in, involving secular businesses, where the courts have said that uh, one famous case involved the California Supreme Court ruling where a shopping mall was sued by a female employee who was sexually assaulted by another employee and uh, she sued the mall corporation and argued that uh, it was negligent and not providing a security guard. And the Supreme Court of California said no security guard was needed because this type of behavior was simply not foreseeable uh, in that facility. Uh, a third type of liability, Jerry, would be uh, negligent selection of security guards by a church. So you could theoretically be liable, even if you hire security, if you were negligent or careless in selecting that person. So, uh, because there's such a wide range of competencies when it comes to security services. So, uh, this kind of thing requires that the, the church exercise due care in the selection process. Is this a licensed security firm that you're using? Get references. You know, contact law enforcement, ask them about this security service. Or better yet, as Jerry mentioned before, is to hire on or off duty uniform police officers as your security detail. Th that doing so has a number of advantages. Number one, the uniform itself is a, is a powerful deterrent, not to crazed assailants, but it is to a lot of people. Number two, police officers have extensive training, not just in the use of firearms, Jerry, but just as importantly, in responding to emergency situations, which can overwhelm the average conceal a weapons permit holder, like myself. I, I mean, you're, you're just emotionally overwhelmed by the experience. And uh, another advantage of using uh, off-duty or on-duty police officers as your security contingent is they have continuing uh, training. It's not just a one-time course you took. And, and I think most importantly, as you mentioned earlier, is a number of courts have concluded that when a police officer is responding to a crime, like an armed assailant, that person ceases to be your employee, your security guard, and becomes a public uh, officer. So what that means is he or she is acting in the line of duty and is no longer acting as your agent or representative. So any question of negligence uh, is deferred from you to the police officer and ultimately the police department. So uh, that's another very important reason to use police officers as opposed to the private security service. And of course, when you're looking at uh, concealed weapons permit holders, they would lack many of these 
characteristics of police officers. They don't become public officers when responding to a crime. They don't have continuing uh, training on the use of firearms. They've had no experience or training on r responding to emer emergency uh, crisis situations in the vast majority of cases, except for those that have prior law enforcement experience or maybe military. And as we said, some of these uh, concealed weapons permit holders are going to have that additional component that I think makes them uh, a more reasonable response. But uh, short of that, or in addition to that, I think using the police officer is an excellent idea. And then the fourth basis for liability in these cases, which we've alluded to, is uh, liability for the acts of those security guards themselves. And here again is why it's so important to use uh, police officers, because when they're responding, if they shoot at that assailant and accidentally hit a bystander, uh, they're acting in the line of duty, they become on duty, it is really, it, it elevates the risk from you and it transfers it to the police officer or to the, the local government. And that's a very important component that doesn't apply when a concealed weapons permit holder that's had four hours of training starts shooting away at an armed assailant and hits members of the congregation. There absolutely can be li liability on the part of the church for that collateral damage. Uh, and that's why it's so important that uh, if you're going to use concealed weapons permit holders as part of your security response, if you decide to do that, that you make sure they have that additional component beyond that normal permit uh, to make them, to establish, I think, their ability and competency to serve in that capacity. That can be prior law enforcement or military training. Uh, that can be additional training the church itself provides, as, as your church does, Jerry. But those are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about. And of course, I also recommend that as part of your policy that you benchmark your, your practices. In other words, look at other facilities in your community, other comparably sized churches or secular entities that use security uh, guards. What, who are they using? How do they, you know, uh, are, what are they doing with regard to concealed weapons permit holders? Find out what they're doing and benchmark your practices to what other charities are doing. That becomes your community standard on which you're going to be judged if you fall below that level and thereby are deemed to be negligent. And of course, uh, let me conclude by saying it's so important to have a legal review of your policy. Uh, your policy should be in writing. Uh, and your security policy, and absolutely that should be reviewed and approved by legal counsel. I'd also recommend you have your local law enforcement uh, check that out as well. You know, so really from using, letting people use concealed carry people, uh, you know, letting, letting them operate as part of your church security team, really the church is picking up additional liability where here they thought they might be saving their people. Mm -hmm. The church is actually accepting more liability because they've let concealed carry people have the guns if there is collateral damage from, uh, from an armed assailant. That's an excellent point. Uh, and, and Jerry, I think it's important here also to talk about your point, the insurance implications here. Uh, we talked about this earlier today, the, the fact that churches need to be careful about misrepresentations they make on their insurance application form. Sometimes those are filled out by a lower level office staff and those are exceedingly important documents where y you can be denied insurance coverage because of misrepresentations. And so, for example, uh, I, you and I are both familiar with a case in, an, in one particular state where a, uh, a child in a church preschool somehow got away from the group and got into a church baptistry and drowned. And the, the, uh, the church turned this horrendous case over to its insurance company, but the insurance company ultimately denied any coverage on the basis of a misrepresentation in the church's insurance application. And when you looked at that application, when one of the dozens and dozens of questions was, do you operate a preschool? And whoever that office worker was, for whatever reason, it was inadvertent, I'm sure, checked the box that said no. That singular act resulted in the loss of insurance coverage for that horrendous death that has the potential for significant economic damages to that church. And they had no insurance.
to provide an attorney to defend them. They have no insurance to indemnify, to pay for any judgment or settlement because of checking the wrong box to one of 50 questions on that insurance application. So uh, the same thing can happen here. Do you have a security guard? Hey, those of you that allow concealed weapons permit holders to wander around the church, do, have you correctly filled out your insurance application? Maybe you need an amendment. You should be contacting your insurance agent to ensure that there's not going to be a potential for misrepresentation based on what you said on that. And let me tell you, again, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, Jerry, uh, that is a very important document. That's going to determine whether you have coverage or not. In, in many cases, make sure those answers are accurate and truthful, and in fact, it should be reviewed. If you have a lower level person in the office, fill that out. Be sure you have somebody, the senior pastor, maybe a board member. There should be a few people. You should have an insurance committee, in my opinion, uh, that evaluates the, the form to be sure that every question is truthfully answered. In addition to that, um, in regards to off-duty police officers operating on behalf of you, we had actually one of our largest claims was uh, we had an individual that was a police officer. And most of the police officers, when, you're, when they're operating off-duty, the local law enforcement uh, agency requires a certificate of insurance from that church uh, so that the law enforcement is not held liable while they're operating or working for the church. And we actually had uh, a law officer actually get hit by a car as he was trying, you know, somebody was trying to take off and uh, was probably doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, but he got hit by a car. And the work comp carrier said, well, he's not actually paid for this, but because they did other things for them, they did consider it remuneration and uh, ended up, the work comp ended up picking up the coverage. So you need to look at your work comp coverage as well as your general liability on how you answer questions to make sure that there is coverage. We do have some questions here, so I'm gonna just try to get to them real quick here. Um, and I will actually say, every state is a little bit different because I've got you know, people asking questions about Iowa, asking questions about Texas. Um, Every state is a little bit different. We know some states will actually let people carry guns in uh, a church. However, having a policy set so you, that the church's liability uh, is minimized is, is, the, is really the key answer, not whether or not your state allows uh, weapons automatically in, uh, in, in your church. And don't assume that's the case without reviewing. I have not reviewed all 50 state statutes or 49 that allow concealed weapons every state but Illinois. But the ones I have reviewed, churches are not, you, you cannot uh, carry your concealed weapon onto church premises without written approval from church leadership. That is common. Now is that true in 49 states? Pro perhaps not. I haven't reviewed all 49 states. But many that I have reviewed have a very similar uh, position with regard to that. So don't just assume that, uh, hey, I think, I've heard in my state, somebody told me we can allow anybody with a concealed weapon has an automatic right to, to bring it onto church premises. Don't assume that's the case without verification because that would be an unusual law in my opinion. And uh, one of the questions we had, um, and this is actually, would we need to become, one of the states said we, we would need to become a registered security company if we allow security with weapons, and I'm not familiar, that's, uh, it's, it, this was in the state of Texas, I'm not familiar with that, but again, having a policy set up, and actually, there are different rules for different states, and we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna go into that. Uh, but you wouldn't need states. that if you, if you use the police officers, as we're recommending. Uh, that's the best case scenario. If you create your own security detail with concealed weapons permit holders, that may have legal implications under your state's law. And that, again, is why it's so important to be familiar with your state law and to have legal review of your ultimate uh, policy. So as, as, as the best answer is, the best scenario is, if you're going to have security guards at church, let them be licensed law enforcement officers that are serving off duty and that they're current law officers. That would be the best case scenario for most churches. Secondly, it would be if you're going to allow concealed carry that they have the same training that the law officers go through. And it's recurrent training so that you, when, when you go to court, if there is collateral damage somehow, 
you're doing the same thing that the local law enforcement does. Those are the two best scenarios I can see that, that operate in our churches. I appreciate your time once again. I appreciate uh, you all. I know that uh, there's lots of questions for different states. Um, you're going to have to look at your own states, get with your legal counsel, but those are the best ways to handle guns and churches. We appreciate your time. God bless. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you.